Heavenly Father, may I speak in your name and in the name of the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this morning we're going to have a look at this uh, passage in Acts. But uh, before that, does anybody know who this guy is? No? Hands up. Does anyone know who he is? Yeah. Colin Kaepernick. Yes, indeed. He was a football player that played football for the San Francisco 49ers in the USA. Back in 2016, he kneeled instead of standing during the pre-game national anthem. You might have seen this in the news. And when he was asked by the media why he was abstaining from, from standing, he said this. I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of colour. To me, this is bigger than football and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. So peaceful, non-violent protest against any kind of oppression, you would think this is to be commended, right? The protest caught on with other teams and other players, regardless of colour and whatnot, teams, players, coaches, choosing to take a knee during the national anthem. However, kneeling during the anthem didn't go down well with many Americans who saw it as an act of disrespect towards the USA and in particular towards their military who died for their flag. And President Trump publicly told NFL owners to fire anybody who was to kneel during the anthem. So at the end of that season, and and following the end of his professional contract at San Francisco, Colin Kaepernick has remained in his prime, unemployed as an American footballer. NFL clubs refused to touch him. Now, I share this story to make this point. These American footballers were heroes as long as they acted in the way that the American public wanted them to. Even though these players protested precisely because they were Americans, it didn't matter that they were protesting injustice in their own country and challenging America to be a more just place. What mattered to many was that they didn't fit a very particular idea of what is acceptable American behaviour. What many people seemed to believe was that American footballers were paid to play and to shut up. And the players that chose to use this platform to speak up against injustice paid a price and were by some treated as traitors for their trouble. Now, this situation that I've highlighted here raises deep, deep questions about what it means to belong. What is the criteria for belonging to a particular group of people? And who decides what that criteria is? Now, this is pretty much how it normally goes when it comes to belonging. Now, you're fine to join us, you're fine to be amongst us, as long as you don't rock the boat. Don't try to shake things up or criticise the way we do things or you might find yourself out on your rear. Popular psychologist Brené Brown claims that the mirror opposite of belonging is fitting in. The alternative to challenging norms is usually to do what you believe that the group expects of you. It's doing what it feels, what it takes to feel like that you are accepted by the in crowd. Putting aside or even losing who you actually are in order to project to the group who you believe that they want you to be. Learning to speak a little bit more properly because you feel people won't take you serious otherwise. Bowing at the cross because that's what somebody told you to do. 
smiling and pretending to be happy because that's what everyone else around you does. We live our lives by unwritten rules of social convention, often opting for the course of least resistance. But what about in the case of the church? We've, we've, we've talked about the NFL and the USA, but what about the church? I mean, on what basis are we supposed to build our life together? What is the bedrock of our communion and our fellowship as Christians? And where is the centre of our identity as the church from which ultimately we will relate to one another? Now, in this Acts passage that we've had read this morning, When the uh, so-called circumcised believers asked Peter that question about eating with the uncircumcised, recognise that this is actually a deeply political question that he's been asking, that he asked. This is because for thousands of years it has been understood and practised by worshippers of the God of Israel that in order to welcome new people into the fold, they must first join the nation of Israel to follow a particular set of laws and ethics that are unique to the nation and form a central part of national consciousness. This also includes a set of food laws. And one such law that we saw in this passage today was that you may not eat a meal with foreigners or those who themselves don't recognise the food laws. And their tribalism ran deep for these believers, for these Israelite believers, and it even affected who they could and who they couldn't have table fellowship with. So when Peter is asked this question when he returns about eating with these Gentiles, it's like asking him, bro, why are you disrespecting the flag? Why are you abandoning the very customs that demark who we as Israelites are? It is a question that ultimately will determine whether Peter is now considered to be an insider or an apostate. And Peter answers these criticisms by explaining that he'd have this vision and that God had made clean that which was before unclean. That God himself had moved those boundaries and had shifted a rule that had standed for many, many years in order to create space for others to belong. It reminds me of those many moments in the Gospels when Jesus said, when Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say. And the climax of Peter's testimony comes from verse 15 onwards. He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, upon the outsiders, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And and I remembered the word of the Lord, the word of Jesus, how he had said that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I would hinder God? So in the first century, God gives this new covenant to the Jewish people whereby he poured out his spirit upon them, creating a temple not in bricks and mortar, but in human flesh. And this was now being extended towards foreigners. All the benefits of the God of Israel without needing to be an Israelite. Something that since the first circumcision, that of Abraham, was exclusively for one national group, was now in this moment being opened up for all the other nations to enter in. Are you seriously saying that God is now going to accept the the uncircumcised alongside the circumcised? That he pours his spirit upon outsiders, making them as much insiders as those who originally were given the promise. That God has spoken that all nations, everyone, regardless of background, creed, language, culture, colour, ethnicity, all could belong. All could come and bring with them all the particularities that made them who they are. And in that instant, everything is changed. The people of God, by the Spirit of God, had been transformed from, you can come and you can become like us, 
come and fit into our group, be transformed from that to come. There's space for you. You can be who you are because you belong here. Even as a Gentile, even as a foreigner. And now at this point, God is fully understood to be God, not only of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles. Such a passage in the Bible naturally turns us back to to look towards ourselves, the church. And it forces us to reappraise our life together. What might be the subtle ways that we ask outsiders to be, as it were, circumcised before they're allowed in? What are the things that God has ordained specifically maybe for you and I that he has not necessarily asked of newcomers? This Bible passage makes it clear that God always planned to open up the kingdom of God wide for anybody who was willing to repent to enter in. We don't get to handpick who enters. That's God's business. And I suggest that no matter which church you're in, whether it's high or low or or middle, such questions need to be addressed within the context of established tradition and culture. Jesus, and and in the first century, and the Christians that we read in this passage, they were every bit the church, as much as anyone else. But if you had a conversation with them and used the word Anglican or, or parish, or common worship, they would not have a clue what you were talking about. This is because the church can never be, never be first and foremost, defined by its particular stream of Christian tradition. So what we at St. Matthew's are, in terms of tradition, in the sea of Christian orthodoxy, is a droplet at most. Not that the droplet is insignificant, but that it is unfair and a misrepresentation of the gospel for us to expect newcomers to our church to need to adopt our specific tradition before becoming a part of our family. Society might expect assimilation, that newcomers simply fit into a set of pre-established conventions. The church, however, makes every effort that when new people join, that when they become us, that we also will become them. St. Matthew's is not just our church. It belongs and will continue to belong fully and completely to anybody God chooses for it to belong to. And this is why each of us have a responsibility as custodians, led by the Holy Spirit and with integrity, to create as much space at St. Matthew's as it takes for people of difference to be able to join and become a part of this family. Perhaps we haven't been clear enough about this, but this is the reason why we do things like Cafe Church and breathe. I, for one, appreciate that for many of us, it's not our preference of how we do worship. But church is not just about me and my preferences. I might prefer to eat meat, but if I am truly to invite a vegetarian to eat with me, I need to be prepared to eat and maybe enjoy eating vegetarian food. So when we try things like Cafe Church, I hope it is at least sending the message that you don't need to be able to to appreciate, you don't need to be fluent in our particular tradition in order to begin worshipping here with us. You don't need to eat meat to sit at our table. And if Cafe Church makes you a little bit uncomfortable or maybe even slightly nauseous, That may actually be a good thing. Rest assured that this is exactly how many people would feel at first when they walk into church for the first time. 
Because one person's discomfort is another person's serenity. May we continue to open ourselves to God's Spirit, who opened up the covenant for us Gentiles to enter in. May we be willing, Lord, to do the same thing here at St. Matthew's, that you may call anybody you wish to come and join us for the sake of your gospel and for the glory of your name. Amen.